Shalom. I'm Eddie Chumney, Hebraic Heritage Ministries, and thank you for watching the Hebraic Roots Network. We are doing weekly teachings on the Torah portions, and this week's Torah portion is Lech Lecha. That's Genesis in chapter 12, verse 1, through Genesis in chapter 17. And so in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, it reads, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get you out of your country and from your kindred and from your father's house unto a land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. And I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curses you. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. Now, if we look at what the Lord had commanded Abraham to do right here in Genesis chapter 12, and also I want to link it with Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1, where it reads, And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am Almighty God, I am El Shaddai, walk before me. And the King James says, be thou perfect. And so what we see here, and what I'm going to be explaining to you, is number one, it is Yeshua who is speaking with Abraham. And secondly, Abraham is being given an opportunity to be the bride of Yeshua. And so first, let's see that it is Yeshua who is appearing to Abraham. We are going to look once again at Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. When Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am Almighty God. I am El Shaddai. So we're going to cross-reference that the one appeared to Abraham is called Almighty God or El Shaddai with the description of Yeshua in Revelation in chapter 1. Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, it says the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach. And then it says in verse 7, he comes with clouds and every eye shall see him. And then in verse 8, I am the Alpha and Omega. Alpha and Omega are the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. And so in Hebrew, it would be I am the Aleph and the Tav. So Yeshua is speaking in Revelation chapter 1 in verse 8. He's the Aleph and the Tav. It says the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come. And that's the meaning of Yahweh. It comes from a Hebrew root, which means to be eternally existent. And so if you're eternally existent, you're past, present, and future, which is, which was, which is to come. Then it says the Almighty. The Alpha and the Omega is also the Almighty. And so the one that appeared to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, is Almighty God. We can also see how it was Yeshua who appeared to Abraham in Galatians in chapter 3. In Galatians chapter 3 in verse 16, it says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, which is Messiah. And so actually, when Paul is emphasizing, it doesn't say seeds, but seed, he's making a reference back to Genesis in chapter 17 and verse 7. And these are the words that Almighty God, Yeshua, said to Abraham. 
I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto you and to your seed after you. And so the covenant that Yeshua is making with Abraham is a blood covenant. And so with a blood covenant, there's an exchange of garments. And also with a blood covenant that a blood covenant is the highest form of covenant that there is. And so the obligations means that if either party breaks the covenant, that ultimately that other party who breaks the covenant, that they deserve to die. And so when Abraham's seed ended up breaking the covenant, this is the Torah basis by which and how Yeshua then was obligated to die to pay the penalty of Abraham's seed for breaking the covenant. And so ultimately then we have this concept of an exchange of garments in 2 Corinthians and chapter 5. And we are going to then read verse 21. So when Yeshua died on the tree and he shed his blood in establishing and bringing forth the new covenant, of course, when he shed his blood, he was making a blood covenant with you and I whenever we accept Yeshua as our Savior and Lord and put his blood on the doorposts of our hearts when we make confession of our sin and ask for forgiveness of sin through his shed blood and then making him Savior and Lord of our lives. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he has made him to be made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Yeshua is made sin for us. And we who are sinners, then we are given his righteousness. We are made the righteousness of God in him. So we have an exchange going on. And so this exchange is going back to the concept of a blood covenant. Next, we're going to see how Yeshua was offering Abraham and his seed to be his bride. In Genesis in chapter 17 and verse 1, the one that appeared to Abraham is Almighty God, and he says, walk before me and be thou, and the King James says, perfect. And the Hebrew word here is the Strong's number 8549. It's the Hebrew word tamim. And I'm going to show you other places in the King James where that Hebrew word tamim appears so that we can get a better understanding of the meaning of the word and its application. Ultimately, tamim means to be whole, complete. It means to be spiritually mature. And we find this in Exodus in chapter 12 and verse 5. It says, your lamb shall be tamim. But here, tamim is translated as without blemish. So, Abraham was asked by Yeshua to walk before him and be without blemish. Now, without blemish is a characteristic of the bride of Messiah. Now, without blemish does not mean that you never sin. It just means that you're mature, you're complete, 
your whole. And so then in Ephesians, in chapter 5, it says in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Messiah loved the congregation and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And so ultimately the characteristic of the bride of Messiah is she's whole, complete. She is without blemish. And so this is what Yeshua called Abraham to be. Now, we're going to see a couple other instances of this word tamim. And we're going to look at Joshua in chapter 24 and verse 14, where it is written, Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in and here it's translated sincerity. It's the Hebrew word tamim. Serve him without blemish. Serve him whole, complete. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. So you notice tamim is linked with truth. And in Genesis 17, 1, Abraham was told to walk and be without blemish. Walk and be to me. So now let's look at another instance where we see the word to me and let's see its association. We're going to go to Psalm 119 and we're going to look at verse 1. It says, Blessed are the Tamim. Here, Tamim is translated as undefiled. Blessed are the undefiled. And how are the undefiled described in Psalm 19, Psalm 119, verse 1? The undefiled are walking in the Torah of the Lord. So Psalm 119 in verse 1, the without blemish, the Tamim are those who walk in the Torah. And so walking is a Hebrew idiom for following the Torah. In Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1, Yeshua, who's Almighty God, said, walk before me. That means follow the Torah and have the characteristic in following the Torah of being without blemish. And we see the same association in Psalm 119, verse 1. Those that are tamim are walking in the Torah of the Lord. We see the same association in Joshua in chapter 24 and verse 14, that we're to fear the Lord, have reverence, respect for the Lord, and live for him, serve him, to meme and in truth. To meme and in truth. Well, what is truth? Psalm 119, verse 142 says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your Torah is the truth. Psalm 119, verse 151, it is written, You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. So Joshua is going to follow the Lord to meme and in truth or following the Torah. We can see in Genesis in chapter 26, and we are going to look at verse 5. It's written about Abraham. Abraham obeyed my voice. He kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my Torah. And so we see that Abraham followed the Torah. And so you might think, how did Abraham follow the Torah? 
because you might associate the Torah with Mount Sinai. Well, at Mount Sinai, the Torah was given to a nation of people, the house of Jacob. And that was what was unique about Mount Sinai is at Mount Sinai, that which started out as an individual, Abraham, and then Isaac and Jacob, that at Mount Sinai, they had become a nation. So the Torah was offered to a nation where here individuals, and in this case, Abraham, is following the Torah of the Lord or the Torah of Yeshua. Then in Genesis in chapter 12, we see that Abraham is called to leave where he grew up and go to a land that I will show you. So Abraham lived in Ur of the Chaldees, and today that area is associated with what was historical Babylon. And so we see that Abraham's journey was from Babylon to the promised land, and that is our spiritual journey as well. We're called to come out of the world and the world system, which is personified by Egypt. It's personified by Babylon. And in Revelation, in chapter 18, this is what those who believe in the God of Israel, the followers of Yeshua as the Messiah, are called to do in Revelation 18, verse 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and it's become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And it says, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Verse 4, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Well, that's what Abraham did. He came out of Ur of the Chaldees. He came out of Babylon. And so then when Abraham left and obeyed, he's not only engaging in the spiritual journey of leaving the world's ways, the world system, and he's seeking to do the will of the one who called him to leave his place and to go to a land that he would be shown, the promised land. And today we call the promised land the land of Israel. And so ultimately then what he was being asked to do was to leave the known way of life and to follow and do the will of the God of Israel and journey into the unknown. He was to leave the known and go into the unknown because he had never been to what was in that day the land of Canaan, which is today the land of Israel. And so because he had never been there, it was a journey or a walk of faith. This is the reason why we're told in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, and he believed in the Lord and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And so where it says he believed in the Lord, this is where we get the word faith from. It's the Hebrew word from which we get the word faith. And so faith in Hebrew is amunah. And so... This is why it says, by faith, it was counted unto him for righteousness. And so the way that this walk goes then is the God of Israel will call you out of the known, your known world to the unknown. Well, guess what? That's going to make you feel uncomfortable because human beings like a known environment. So if you're going to go from what you're accustomed to and used to and you know and you understand to something that is unknown, you hadn't experienced before, it's going to require faith and trust in the one that's calling you to go to that unknown place. And so 
following and doing the will of the God of Israel requires trust and faith in him. But in order to keep us anchored in that trust, in that faith, when the God of Israel calls us to do his will, when he calls us to leave the known to the unknown, he will make a promise to us that our eyes will be focused on the promise that we have been given. And so here's the promise that Abraham was given in Genesis in chapter 12 and verse 2. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you and curse you that curse you. And so then we see um, this is a promise. And so given a promise to anchor his faith is what also was done to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. Because Abraham said, I don't have a son of my own that is that child of promise. And so then here is what he's told in Genesis chapter 15 verse 5. He brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and see if you could number the stars, if you are able to count them, so shall your seed be. Well, Abraham lived a lifestyle where he was a nomad. He lived in a tent. And so at night, he would have the opportunity to look up into the sky. And when he looked up in the sky, he was reminded then on a daily basis, on a nightly basis of the promise of God that his seed would be as the stars of the sky. In other words, you cannot number them. Well, look what the promise of God is entailing. Abraham is crying out in Genesis 15 to have a son from his own loins. And God's telling him, your descendants are going to be so many, you can't even number them. So, Abraham is hoping, praying, believing that he can have a son. And here God promises that his descendants will be so many, you cannot number them. And so there's a conflict between the perceived natural reality and the promise of God. And this is how this faith spiritual journey in God works. And so Abraham then his righteousness before the God of Israel was not based upon his personal merit. It was based upon him putting his complete trust in the God of Israel, in Yeshua, the Messiah. And so then the Torah then teaches through Abraham's life that Our righteousness comes by and through having faith and trust and confidence in the God of Israel and in his promises. But Abraham had to believe and act upon the command that he was given. And so it was his trust in the God of Israel that was counted as righteousness but he had to show action that he believed in that promise. And so the action made his trust complete. It made his trust without blemish. It made his trust whole. And so then we see in Romans in chapter 4, Paul is teaching regarding Abraham and his walk of faith. And it says, what shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh has found? If Abraham was justified by works, that is made righteous by his own merit, his his own efforts, he has the glory, but the glory is not given to God. For what 
says the scripture, and now Paul was quoting from Genesis 15, verse 6, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that works, the reward is not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Verse 16, therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to also those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And so then we have in James, in chapter 2, James chapter 2, in verse 14, it says, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or a sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, you give them not those things that are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so faith, if it does not have works, is dead, being alone. A man may say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. But will you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? See thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was his faith made whole, complete, tamim. All right, so if you're looking at it in a traditional Christian way um, of salvation, um, as it regards to salvation, that it's not by our works, but after we're saved by Messiah's righteousness, what he did, now we have to love him, keep his commandments, and we have to have the fruit of the Spirit, which comes by the way in which we live our lives. And so our salvation is by faith and grace and not by our own merit. But once we receive salvation by faith without our own merit, then we live a godly life to demonstrate that we really did believe what we said we believe in trusting in Yeshua and by living a holy life, then we are mature and whole or complete in Messiah. And so this is what we learn from Abraham's life, who's the father of our faith. And that's also what Paul taught in the New Testament. So I pray that this helps you. Shalom. Shalom.